Ladies and gentlemen, today's featured segment is presented to you by Radioactive Redhead. From book two of the Warlock series, author Mike Bennett brings to life tales from distant lands, detailing the undertakings of special operators as they pursue an Iranian-funded menace. Operators roam from Kurdistan to Pakistan, and no stone is left unturned in Turkey. Will justice be brought to close the ledger for the tragic 1983 Beirut bombing? Join us as we present to you, When Towers Fall. When Towers Fall, Chapter 1 His shocking red hair cropped short. The young marine gazed at his boot that lay several meters away with his severed foot secured within. The blast had not yet rendered him unconscious, but he was aware of the chaos round him, and presently saw other marines writhing as his own pain set in. His world then closed to blackness, blood spurting copiously from the stump below his knee, soaking the rich Lebanese soil. Ultimately, the source of the 21,000-ton TNT-equivalent bomb came from a camp in the Bekwa Valley in Lebanon that was supported by Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC. Nearly immediately after the Cultural Revolution that spawned the U.S. Embassy takeover in 1979, Iran had begun building proxy networks to export terror. Although the plot was originally determined to have sprung from within elements of the Islamic Jihad, a new terror group called Hezbollah emerged as the culprit and the puppet of Iran. The mastermind of the 1983 Marine Barracks bombing that killed 241 American servicemen was a 21-year-old engineering student called Imad Bayez Mugnia. Two days later, Private Second Class Jacob was buffeted by the C-130 slipstream as he lurched through the jump door under the weight of his basic load, Alice Pack and M-16. His static line stretched taut as he fell, and it pulled his parachute from the pack tray. The silk caught the warm Caribbean air as the canopy fully blossomed and he briefly drifted over the island of Grenada. Private Second Class Jacob knew nothing of the composition of Joint Task Force 120, the disapproving diplomatic gnashing of the United Nations, nor did he know of the downstream implications of the Goldwater Nichols Act that came about as the result of Operation Urgent Fury. He was a 19-year-old private who descended from the 400-foot drop to Point Salines Airfield under sporadic, but frightening 23mm anti-aircraft fire from the Soviet-supplied ZU-23s. His squad had been detailed to first secure the northeast corner of the airfield, and when sufficient combat power had amassed, he helped others clear obstacles on the runways so follow-on forces could expand the airhead and move onward to designated targets, like the Grand Anse campus. He saw no direct combat action that day, but when it was all over, Private Second Class Jacob knew one thing. He was a ranger, and he had found special purpose in soldiering. Wheels up at 0245, and once again, Specialist Jacob was knees in the breeze, this time over Rio Hato Airfield in Panama. Sergeant First Class Jacob loved Savannah, with its true southern bells languorously draping a butterbean beach chair or gracing the Tybee Island Pirate Fest. He loved the smell of the salt in the air, the crisp breeze whipping spray off the churning Atlantic surf. The army was a cruel master, however, and Sergeant First Class Jacob had his orders to permanent change of station to the interior of Georgia to Fort Benning, where the summers baked the red clay under the unrelenting sun. Although he had just spent the last two years as a platoon sergeant, Sergeant First Class Jacob had been looking forward to taking new challenges beyond those of a normal 11B. He was fortunate, perhaps destined, to end up on the rolls of the Regimental Reconnaissance Detachment. He soaked up the new skills, military freefall, pathfinder, and the use of an array of cameras that were used in surveillance prior to the commitment of the main force. At the age of nearly 29 years old, he found he was often the old man around the young soldiers, but he gleefully applied his experiences as a ranger over two combat engagements while mentoring those who might benefit. His reputation was so solid 
that he had been read into special forces access programs to conduct planning for an American intervention at Somalia. His efforts were further rewarded with orders to deploy as an augmentee to the task force ranger staff at Mogadishu. Although he played a fairly minor role, his maturity and balanced intensity had been noticed by a former unit commander, Major General William Garrison, the JSOC commander. If this preview broadcast has piqued your curiosity, the book in its entirety will be available for purchase from Amazon.com. Simply search When Towers Fall by Mike Bennett and peruse a catalog of its latest works. Be sure to tune in to Radioactive Redhead to hear further excerpts from the Warlock series. This concludes today's featured segment from Radioactive Redhead. May your days be filled with good memories and laughter, and God bless.